Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Jay McClellan from Stanford University. Uh, he is uh, uh, the Lucian Stern Professor and former department chair in the psychology department. Um, he has received, well, he, he got a PhD in cognitive psychology from uh, University of Pennsylvania in 1975 and has received numerous awards uh, including uh, being a member of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Um, and his work, uh, while it, it is in the, philosophy, uh, in the psychology department, uh, spans a bunch of different fields, which is why he's uh, uh, able to speak now uh, among us who are uh, people in AI. Uh, so with that, I want to keep this brief. Uh, I'll let you uh, start, Jay. Okay. Um Thanks. So uh, the title of my talk today is Are People Still Smarter Than Machines? And um, uh, the plan for the talk is to review the motivation, uh, the nature, and the current state of neural network models of intelligence um, from my own perspective, which I consider to be a parallel distributed processing point of view. And I will share what I mean by that. It's sort of not just he uses neural networks, but there's some principles beyond just neural networks that go into that. Um, and we're gonna consider whether people are still smarter than machines and in what ways. Um, and we're gonna consider what makes humans as smart as they are and how we might go about getting neural network models to match some of their remaining advantages over current artificial systems. So the motivations for the PDP approach, which um, I began taking with Dave Rumhardt and others uh, in the very early 80s, late 70s even, uh, perhaps uh, culminating in the publication of our two books um, called Parallel Distributed Processing, which were my introduction to being a part of a super interdisciplinary research framework where we had neuroscientists, computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists, and psychologists like me, uh, all trying to think about these things at the same time. So by the early 1980s, computers could carry out millions of operations per second and computer programs had been written that could solve any integral differential equation with a known solution, but computers couldn't recognize objects, understand language or play at a human level in uh, games like chess or go. And it was easy to say that people were smarter than machines back then and to seek alternatives to the kinds of models being used in artificial intelligence at that time. We also were very interested in the importance of learning. In the 80s, computers hardly ever learned anything. Knowledge was programmed into them by experts. That system of, that solved integral differential equations was all programmed explicitly for uh, the set of cases that uh, could come up. So as humans, we learn we learn to recognize objects, we learn to speak languages, we learn to solve math problems, we learn to play games like chess and go. And so in seeking to build machines as smart as people, we had to think about the learning problem. So why were people smarter than machines? This was the question that we sought to answer uh, in introducing our framework. And uh, we believed that people were smarter than than machines because they simultaneously exploited multiple graded and often ambiguous sources of information in a massive mutual constraint satisfaction process as they interpret the world, understand language and select appropriate actions. And um, you know, this image, uh, I, not everyone sees it on the first go, but there's a dog with his nose to the ground uh, right in the middle of the picture. You, and once you see that dog, uh, all the, pieces sort of fall together to make a, a coherent image of a dog sniffing at, a gra at the ground, even though there's no individual elements of it that you know unambiguously tell you that. And so all these graded constraints sort of somehow simultaneously constrain each other together with prior context and experience to lead you to see what's there. And machines didn't seem to be doing that at all back then. We also argued that people rely on learned 
continuous valued parameters to assign the appropriate weightings to each source of information when they're solving these constraint satisfaction problems. And we noted that the brain consists of large process, uh, populations of massively interconnected neurons participating simultaneously, influencing each other through weighted synaptic connections. So this, was, this picture was very um, inspiring to me. It's actually um, a drawing of uh, one one hundredth of the cell bodies of neurons in a very, very thin slice that's one millimeter by one millimeter uh, uh, through the cortex of a mammal, uh, the brain of a mammal. And uh, you see uh, the, the little triangular shaped or pyramidal neurons, which are the, which we have hundreds of millions or billions of in our brain, each of which has these huge dendritic arbors that can receive up to 100,000 synaptic inputs. And so uh, each of these uh, units is sort of able to participate in integrating a large number of simultaneously available constraints. Maybe that's really important for thinking about how we solve these problems. And maybe the graded synaptic connections among these things are uh, the basis on which we, we do it. Um, so we therefore propose to address the kinds of problems computers couldn't solve by using by, with using conventional approaches by using artificial neural networks inspired by these aspects of cognition and its neural basis. And I want to emphasize that we were primarily motivated by, motivated by the cognitive questions and the neural inspiration provided us guidance in thinking about what the implementation might be like. But it wasn't a desire to just build a machine that was like a brain per se, it was to solve the problems that other systems would solve. So um, I wanna call out Dave Rommelhart, who was obviously a hugely influential prime mover in this. He was seven years senior to me, just got tenure when I arrived as an assistant professor at UCSD. Uh, back in, I arrived in 74, we started to work together in the late 70s and we developed something called the interactive activation model of letter perception to instantiate several of the ideas we've already mentioned. So this addressed the human ability to use context to identify letters in words and pronounceable non-words. So for example, what's the second letter in this display here? Well, uh, part of the display has been obscured so you can't tell whether it's a T or an I, but uh, the context um, provides information that might help you disambiguate that. And we constructed a neural network that had units for features in each of four positions for words that are four letters long, uh, sets of units for letters, and then a collection of units for all the words uh, in a vocabulary of about 1,200 words. And um, we used excitatory connections between mutually consistent units in different pools, inhibitory connections between all units within a pool or a rectangle in, in this diagram. And um, uh, we provided input to the feature units, initiating an interactive activation process that proceeds gradually over time. So there's each time step is an incremental adjustment of the activation value of each unit in the network based on the inputs it's receiving from all other units. And this proceeds over a series of iterative time steps resulting in the network settling into an interpretation where in this case, the word time would be active and uh, the letter I in the second position would be active and the letter T would have been suppressed even though initially they would have both been consistent with the bottom up input. Um, the model didn't learn but it inspired us to start thinking about learning since letters and words are arbitrary and vary from language to language. So how can a neural network learn to do something cognitively interesting? And this was, you know, Roman Hart was super important here uh, too. Um, we started thinking from this sort of biologically inspired approach, listening to Don, Donald Hebb and his ideas like, well, if neuron A participates in firing neuron B, then let's strengthen the connections between them. But um, Jeff Hinton actually was, was a, a postdoc and in the lab and he brought the computer science into this. And he said, listen, you know, you need to, think about this from a different point of view. You need to think about this as, a, as an optimization problem. 
So starting with what biology might actually do isn't going to answer the question. Dave heard him say that, listened very carefully, and decided to figure out how to um, optimize all the connection weights in a multilayer neural network to uh, um, minimize the error between the network's output and uh, some specified teaching signal. Uh, so that was the backpropagation learning algorithm. And um, this became the basis of subsequent research, research in the framework, as well as almost all of deep learning. Uh, as many of you know, backpropagation is still like, well, how does the brain actually do that? You know, how do we pass these gradient signals around in the brain? So um, this is where I think I sort of, you know, moved a little bit towards the abstraction of ab, uh, uh, thinking about these models in computational terms, even though they were still grounded in a basic set of inspirations from neuroscience. And we started calling them brain-inspired models uh, rather than brain-constrained models. So um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we had some uh, early successes in my lab after I moved to Carnegie Mellon uh, and Rummel Hart moved to Stanford in the late 80s, um, where um, we would apply these models to uh, things that humans seem to do uh, quite well um, uh, and in different ways than people had thought about them before. So when we map from uh, spelling to sound, when we figure out how to pronounce an, uh, a non-word uh, like these two items here, um, you know, the conventional approach would have been we use a system of rules, right? Um, M is pronounced M, and a vowel followed by a consonant followed by E gets its long vowel correspondence. That would be rules. Um, but we showed that, gee, you know, we could train a little neural network that maps from orthography to phonology, and we could capture people's responses, which don't always obey these rules. So about 10% of people will say MAV instead of MAVE when they see this item. And people divide 50-50 for uh, G-R-O-O-K -okay as to whether they think it's grook or grook. And um, our models capture these findings because in learning from a corpus of examples of real words, which include the word have, which is an exception, and uh, words that have both of those kinds of vowel correspondences for double O's, the network also sort of, you know, picks up on the fact that, well, some of these things are completely consistent, others are not, and, and they will capture the, um, the tendencies that people have to uh, not necessarily follow any particular systems or rules, but, but uh, accord with frequency and typicality uh, relationships rather than strictly a set of rules. Uh, we extended this to model semantic cognition. This is work that I, I spent a lot of time doing. And one of the exciting things about this was a neural network that was trained with a corpus of objects and their properties would show developmental trends that were similar to human learning about uh, objects and properties. They gradually learned to differentiate finer and finer categories in ways that were consistent with human data. And further, when we took our neural networks that were trained to do this and we degraded them by randomly deleting neurons or connections in the network, the networks would show the same patterns of disintegration that we see in uh, uh, patients with semantic impairment. And, and this sort of made me feel like, okay, there's some, even though this neural network idea is kind of abstract, there's still something about it that's like correct, right? Because we, we only had like hundreds of units instead of the brain having millions. But still, as you remove a few of these hundred, each of them by itself doesn't have any specific crucial role, but collectively they uh, capture the things that are statistically robust and preserve that kind of knowledge as you degrade them while losing the fine details and the exceptions uh, earlier on as they disintegrate. So something about that that really seemed like it was um, foundational to the way our brains actually uh, implement our cognitive abilities. Um, 
There were also models that showed in principle how aspects of language knowledge could be captured in simple artificial network. And uh, Elman, Jeff Elman, who was uh, our colleague at UCSD in the linguistics department, uh, developed uh, his simple recurrent neural network that uh, was trained to do prediction. He, it would be given a word and its task was to simply predict the next word after it in a corpus of text. Uh, he introduced this in his paper uh, called Finding Structure in Time in uh, 1990, uh, using this incredibly simple uh, backprop trained uh, network that had an input for the current word, one hidden layer, an output for the prediction of the next word, and a copy of its own previous hidden state um, as another source of contextual information. And it learned to assign representations to input words. You think of the hidden representation there um, that's produced when the input word like hit or ball are presented, which when you take those and you put them into a hierarchical clustering uh, algorithm, uh, captures the abstract linguistic categories of nouns and verbs. And within those subcategories that are important for um, language prediction, like animacy. I'm not showing the distinction between nouns and verbs. That's the biggest split in, in the set of patterns. But within the nouns, it splits between the animate and the inanimate and further uh, animals from humans and so on because of the predictive consequences of these categories for uh, the uh, next words in, in the corpus. Uh, suggesting that these categories needn't be innate contra uh, ideas that were uh, so prevalent um, in uh, the 60s through 80s. Okay, however, so this was great, right? We were like on a roll. Elman's paper was cited more than any other paper in cognitive science in the early 1990s. Um, but they weren't, these models weren't impacting in artificial intelligence as much as um, uh, they seem to be in psychology at that time. And uh, here are some of the reasons why not. I think that the word reading models could only accommodate one syllable words. We, we restricted them to that. And when we tried to scale them up, it, you know, they, they didn't work as robustly. Elman's model used only a 20 word vocabulary. So there was a small number of nouns and a small number of verbs. And he illustrated these basic principles, but you know, was it going to scale up? And um, there were computational limitations. In particular, people were um, acutely aware that it was extremely time-consuming and slow to train very deep networks. And Jeff Hinton, you know, thought depth was very important, but was somewhat demoralized by the fact that. Uh, learning and neural networks seem to be exponential in the number of layers. So things were, you know, kind of stalled for a while there, I think. Um, but over the last decade, as I'm sure all of you know, this is all dramatically changed. And Hinton's group's uh, AlexNet achieved a breakthrough in image classification. Um, DeepMind's Q learning system surpassed human level performance in many Atari games. Um, human players no longer stand a chance against Alpha, Alpha Zero or now Mu Zero at games like chess and Go. And um, neural machine translation and speech recognition, um, you know, became these powerful, effective systems that are in use by billions of people every day. There was an article called The Great AI Awakening. Uh, I think it, it very early um, uh, 2016. Um, that was inspired primarily by the Google Neural Machine Translation System. So what changed? The scale of computing and the size of available data sets. So um, this Apple II sort of suggests the kind of resources we had at our disposal back in the early 80s. Uh, we had a slightly bigger machine than that, but it cost like, you know, half a million dollars, right? <laughs> and uh, nowadays you can get this NVIDIA GPU for like 3,000 bucks that has a uh, hugely more compu computer power than uh, anybody it dreamed of back then. Uh, so I, you know, Moore's law says computing power doubles every two years. That means that it grows by a factor of a thousand every 20 years. So we, uh, from 
1980 to now, we are uh, we have a million times more computing at our disposal than we did in 1980, and for a millionth of the cost per flop. It's just like you, you can't ignore the importance of this factor. Um, so at the same time, there's massive data sets and text, text and images to learn from and for games. We can generate an infinite, indefinite amount of self-play by having uh, different instances of the same neural network playing against each other and uh, kind of challenging each other to do better and better. Um, and these things uh, have been incredibly powerful in allowing these breakthroughs to occur. Um, the architectural innovations have been essential as well. And I'm going to point to one of them in the next three to five minutes that I have found exceedingly impactful uh, and was at the core of the GNMT and uh, has played a huge role in many ways. So this is um, relevant to an issue that comes up in language processing, uh, which plagued Elman's simple recurrent network, which was uh, it really uh, struggled to use more than just a very sh a small amount of immediately adjacent context. But when we think about language, uh, we, we have to use context that extends over indefinite amounts of time. So let's just consider this little example. Uh, John put some beer in a cooler and went out with his friends to play volleyball. Soon after he left, someone took the beer out of the cooler. So then we can imagine a story going on in which John and his friends are competing like crazy with some other group of people that they met at the beach and there there is a fierce match and finally you know John hits this amazing spike and he beats this beats the other guys at the game uh, and they win the last match and they all go home triumphantly and then when they get back to John's house um, they were thirsty so they went back to his place to, to get some beers and, but when John opened the cooler, he discovered that the beer was gone. You know that it's gone, right? You held on to that context. It's not visible anymore on the screen. And um, if we had said somebody took the ice out of the cooler, you would have said he discovered that the beer was warm, right? So you're able to use context to constrain your interpretation of language over an indefinite uh, amount of intervening text. I argue myself that it could you could go to sleep overnight and come back and hear the rest of the story the next day. So it's not like it has to be in some active state in some buffer. Um, but um, how, how do we solve this problem? Well, RNNs are not going to do it for us because, uh, and this was the argument that was made by those who introduced these, uh, the mechanism I'm going to describe, it's got this limited uh, vector. It's a single vector of maybe it's 4,000 units or even uh, 10 times that, but it's still one vector and every element of context has to be packed into that. Or maybe it's several such vectors, but there's still a finite number of them. And um, the uh, insight of query-based attention, uh, which is the foundation of the transformer, is the idea that um, we can at a given moment, we can have a query and we can have a record in, a, in, in most of these models. There is a fixed length buffer, but it might be 3000 elements long of the past elements in the context. And so we send out a query and we say, is anything out there sort of match my query? And if so, send me back some additional information. So here, for example, this query, which is a pattern, uh, partially matches the uh, representation for the word hit and the word with, and so we, and it doesn't really match any of the others. So this query pulls back further information associated with hit and with, and then we uh, weight these retrieved vectors uh, by the, degree to which the query matches the, um, the stored representation. And then we get back this weighted attention vector that gives us information about um, what verb was there, which might help me decide whether this is a baseball bat or a flying bat, or uh, what was the instrument used? You know, well, you hit balls with 
bats. So um, hitting and the preposition with uh, probably are relevant. And this would help disambiguate whether uh, this word refers to a bat or um, something else. Uh, relatedly, uh, and this is why I think we can sustain this stuff overnight, um, we can imagine that uh, we have an offline memory where we can like write patterns of activation into, uh, in this case, they use explicit slots. I don't think the brain actually uses explicit slots. I think we have to have a distributed solution to this, but um, this, the, it, that distributed solution approximates this slot-based memory in a, in a way that's close enough to make this uh, model very inspiring and useful. So the idea is that we can write current information into a slot in a, in a, a store that will persist overnight while we're sleeping. And then in the next day, we can issue a query into this and retrieve information. Uh, and this idea uh, is the foundation of the differentiable neural computer that was introduced uh, by Graves and Wayne building on the uh, query-based attention idea. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, also represented an important part of these uh, important architectural breakthroughs. Um, so uh, one of the things about this that's really uh, inspired me a lot is that mutuality idea and going back to that, um, in this instance, we have a sentence like, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Um, and you just read that, it doesn't, what's the big deal? Um, or another sentence like, the pole vault was the last event. And again, you just like read it. But if you notice, the word went in one sentence is exactly the same bit of handwriting. This is actually Rommelhart's handwriting as it is in the other one. It's been cut and pasted into the context. And yet you see it as one thing in one context and as the other in the other. And to me, this sort of illustrates and certainly Rommelhart thought it reflected this mutuality. And uh, the key point I'm just wanting to make here is that the BERT model, which has really attracted a huge amount of enthusiasm and interest, uh, uses this query-based attention in parallel across all elements of up to 256 um, you know, word, word like uh, subunits of text. Uh, so here for just uh, a, a sequence of five, you know, you have the query, uh, I'm representing that was a little red box that's then being compared to uh, the keys from all of the other words. And then they're resulting in the uh, weighted attention vectors that get passed forward. And I'm showing here that it's happening at one position, but actually in BERT, it's happening at all the positions simultaneously. So they're all influencing each other as the network is trying to interpret each word in the context of all the other words. So that's um, deep learning has uh, achieved uh, amazing uh, architecture that can contribute to uh, mutual constraint satisfaction in a big way. And I think that's uh, exciting. So um, I've done some work uh, in a paper that recently appeared and I'm going to uh, summarize this extremely briefly and just put the reference on here so I can get on to other things. But uh, we've argued in this paper that um, using query-based attention simultaneously, not just within language, but for uh, things that are interpreting visual input and linguistic inputs in parallel and mutually constraining each other to use language to constrain what objects you see and objects to constrain how you interpret language and a more global context to constrain both of those things together with this uh, differentiable neural computer-like uh, offline storage system where we can store the results of these computations and access them at later times. And that's what this is supposed to illustrate. This will be a fundamental part of the, um, of the next generation of uh, models of human language understanding that exploit these cool, exciting new ideas, uh, including query-based attention from um, uh, deep learning, and will also be uh, an important way of moving forward for artificial uh, language understanding systems. 
So deep learning models build on the principles of parallel distributed processing and extend them to capture the phenomena that motivated the framework. That's the point of all of that. Uh, and they function well enough to be in use every day. Uh, and they exceed human performance in games like chess and go and they're getting more and more powerful every day. So in some ways, the game is over. Like we said, well, why are humans still smarter than machines? Because they lack these abilities. Now machines have them. And so that's great. And, uh, however, um, humans are still smarter in other ways. And that's what I want to be talking to you about for the rest of this time. So uh, many people, of course, are deeply aware of these points. Uh, neural networks require massive data sets and show poor out of sample generalization. So to learn to use context and language, we use gradient descent to predict or fill in words using a corpus of, what is that, 400 billion to 1 trillion words? These are the training corpora of GPT-3 and BERT. Um, to master chess or go, we use uh, game outcome information derived through playing 24 million to 120 million games. Um, no human in their lifetime could play anything like any that number of games. Uh, models often generalize poorly if tested with examples drawn from a different distribution than their training data, while humans are often able to generalize from much more limited experience. In fact, humans can perform new tasks without any prior experience. You are the humans here, and you're going to perform this task. Some of you may have seen this task, but maybe not all. Uh, so um, here it is. Uh, you're given a grid like what you see here, and you're given an instruction. Place two Xs in each row, column, and bounded region in the grid at left. No two Xs can be adjacent, not even diagonal. Okay, this appeared in the New York Times a few months ago. And uh, it caught my attention because that was it. You know, you've just got the grid in this instruction and you look at it, well, okay, what am I supposed to do now? Well, I think many of you may already be able to begin to think about what you might do. And when I've done this in smaller groups, I've asked people to tell me where they might be able to put X's. And there's always several people who uh, have already realized that you could put an X at the um, in each of the two uh, uh, bounded regions that are exactly three elements long, uh, the one in the third column and the one in the fourth column, because you know there have to be two X's in there, and they you know they can't be next to each other, so they must be at the two ends of those uh, three box uh, bounded regions. And you're already up and running. You know how to solve this, and and you know in fact. Um, Without any further instruction, people can solve this. And so we don't need 24 million training examples. <laughs> uh, we don't need any uh, in this case. And we've never really done this task before. Um, humans can often learn very quickly from brief instructions and explanations. So I was so intrigued by the to not touch example, because I was already working with my student, Andrew Nam, who was interested in this question. Uh, and it, in the context of Sudoku, which is in some ways very similar to to not touch. And so what he did was he took humans with no prior Sudoku experience. He told them that the goal of the game is to start from a grid with some digits filled in and add digits so that each house, that is each row column or three by three box, contains exactly one instance of each digit. Uh, sorry, I wanna show you the grid. There's a grid. Uh, many of you, I assume, have seen this before. And they're told only put a digit in a cell when you're certain that it has to go there. And they're then showed a grid like this one. Uh, and they're walked through the reasoning that allows them to determine that one of the two candidate digits that occurs three times in the grid must be the digit that goes in the green cell. So they always see uh, grids which have a highlighted um, row or column. Half of them get a column, half of them get a row. Uh, and then um, uh, there's always one cell in that, which is uh, green, always green, where they have to figure out what digit they can place in that cell based on the information provided. And they're walked through figuring out how to solve that. And although they 
don't get the hang of this immediately. Some do, but not everybody gets it immediately. Many get it within a few trials. And so uh, after, let's say 10, to be generous, it's actually more like five, I would say, uh, the people who are going to solve it have like got it, it's kind of clicked in and occasionally they're still making mistakes, but they make mistakes at a pretty low level um, and um, after that. And um, they also generalize nearly perfectly from narrow experience. So during their training, they always have the same house highlighted, the same row or column, the cell in it that they solved for was always the same. And there was always a limited subset of digits that could have been uh, the target or the distractor digit that, that occurred three times in the display. And um, so then we get to test for uh, generalization to new positions of the row, uh, new, whether it's a switch from a row to a column and which set of digits are being used. And, um, I just went over all of that. And basically uh, their performance is completely unaffected by switching uh, the digit set. They do show in a, a momentary kind of like uh, boggle, I would say um, in the first few test trials after they are switched from on the trials where it's, the, it's a column instead of a row or a row instead of a column if their previous experience was with the other one. But uh, after just a small number of trials, they're like back to like performing equally on those two cases. So the generalization is virtually perfect with respect to the digits and um, there's no generalization decrement with respect to digits and a very brief, uh, a little bit of uh, interference or, or um, decrement uh, when you switch the house type. However, only half the participants learned the task, even after 25 trials with explanations. So in those 25 practice trials, they had to put a digit in the green cell and then they were told, no, that you can't decide that that digit has to go there because it could go in, if it was one of the digits that doesn't appear anywhere, it could have gone in any one of the blue cells in there. You have no idea whether it has to go in that green cell or not. Um, and, and so on. So they were given very explicit instruction in the constraints here in play, and they still didn't get it after 25 trials. And um, they eventually get the idea that they need to choose between one of the two digits that occurs frequently in the display, but they just plateau there and they, oh, uh, they do crazy stuff like they decide that if most of the digits that are already in the column are even, then it can't be an even number digit or something. They're using, you know, like random. Uh, things and but they mostly know that they're just like uh, I don't really know what's going on here, so I made up this idea. Hopefully, it's better than just random guessing, you know. So people aren't necessarily super smart in this, but the ones who get it um, get it quickly and generalize perfectly. So that's that's my take home message from this. And participants with more education are much more likely to be solvers. So DeepMind has a Sudoku network, actually. Does it generalize as humans do? Well, it does generalize perfectly across all of the positional variables because its ability to do so was built in by the designers of the network. A very smart DeepMind engineer named Adam Santoro came up with a really good uh, idea about how to achieve perfect positional invariance. And it's related to the transformer idea, but it's, uh, and, and uh, they imported that into this. And so bingo, it perfectly generalizes to all of the positional variables. Uh, but um, they didn't build in uh, this perfect generalization ability across the digits. And so if you actually trained it with a subset of the digits as the targets, it would not in fact generalize to other digits. Um, now my student, uh, and I were able to build this ability in. We sort of took Santora's idea and we applied it to digits as well as positions and that worked. So it could if we built it into the architecture. And so 
that leads to the question, ah, well, maybe people are so smart because they have certain kind of constraints built into their architectures. Um, so here's, uh, many of you may know that this is an old argument against neural networks. Fodor and Politian uh, argued that we can only understand novel sentences because our minds are designed to process language according to category and structure sensitive rules. And they focused on modus ponens as an example of such a rule. Um, also thinking that it applied to like the subject is the first noun dominated by the verb, you know, that kind of sort of structure sensitive constraint in, in linguistics. But um, you know, the basic idea is, well, for any propositions P and Q, if you know P is true and you know that P implies true, then we can conclude that Q is true, right? That's um, something that applies regardless of what these propositions P and Q are about. Um, and we need to build that in in order to capture human uh, cognitive abilities. Neural networks typically don't do that. That's why they should be, um, we should not keep looking at them, according to them. And you know, many other people have argued similar things, uh, uh, including up till very recently. And you know, so Omen uh, Lake et al. Um, made very similar arguments recently, uh, argue, proposing that systematicity is an inherent feature of human cognition. The systematic treatment of uh, arbitrary instances of things as though they were exemplars of a general class about which you learn. Um, abstract rules. So here's the argument against this. And this is my key point for the talk today. Um, really, there's a couple points here. First is neural language models that avoid building in structure far outstrip models that rely on explicit category and structure sensitive rules. So BERT and the other language models uh, do not build this stuff in. And they, satis they, they work for doing language understanding and machine translation in ways that people who tried to build in this sort of structure have not been able to achieve. Um, so, you know, many people are now joining this bandwagon for this reason. And, and uh, even it, it's, it's still true that these models have deficits. They are not human-like in all ways. And I don't want you to think I believe that, but, um, they didn't achieve as much as they have by building that stuff in. And um, uh, I've always tended to feel like, well, the more you build in, the more you sort of force it into some procrustean bed that is gonna limit its ability to make use of the nuances, the frequency sensitivity. And that was argued specifically in the Google Neural Machine Translation paper. They said, we need lots of depth in, in this model to capture these nuances, but we." They didn't ever refer to the idea that they might need explicit rules. So that's one thing. Let's not build those in because they will constrain us too much. That's uh, at least a, a heuristic that um, I intend to continue to refer to. So and the other point is that humans often fail to perform in the systematic ways we'd expect if category and structure sensitivity is built in. And the final point is that the human ability to perform in structure sensitive ways is highly education dependent. So I see that I'm running close to the end of my hour here and I um, want to leave time for questions. So I'm gonna try to make um, what could take, you know, 15 or 20 more minutes. I'll try to hit the high points of that. So I'll be skipping a few slides, but um, I just wanna hit on this last point again. So I already gave you a hint of this because only a subset of the people in our Sudoku experiment actually got it, right? And were able to uh, do these kinds of things. Let me give you um, one more example. Um, this is work actually that's uh, from the uh, 50 years old now. Um, Lila Gleitman and uh, her husband, Henry Gleitman asked participants to provide a phrase that means about the same as each of many different three word compounds. Here are two examples. Dry birdhouse, that's one example, or kill house bird. And the dash indicates the intonation that they used. So dry 
birdhouse or kill house bird. Okay, so let's think about kill house bird. Think about a paraphrase that you might give of this. So here are some of the participants' responses, and now you get to think about which one you think you would accept. And they did both versions of the experiment. They had to generate their own, and they had to decide whether they would accept other people's. Um, a command to kill a house bird. Is that what kill house bird means? Taking the life of a house bird. A bird that lives in a place where people are killed. So they recruited three groups of participants. Graduate students are persons with PhDs in formal disciplines like linguistics. Um, and uh, undergraduates or college graduates with no intention of doing graduate work and secretaries with high school degrees who had no intention of going to college. And they scored participants' responses in terms of agreement with a system of category and structure sensitive rules. And um, what they found was Right, they never referred to these rules in the instruction. Okay, this is just like, what did people do spontaneously when asked these questions? Only the graduate students or people with PhDs reliably produced paraphrases that were consistent with the rules that govern the, uh, the way we interpret these, uh, we use these uh, grammatically. So the grammatical rules that govern the, the three word compounds that actually occur in language and the meanings that people assign to them were guiding the behavior of only the PhD students and not the others. So there was one undergraduate uh, who was up there at the bottom edge of that. These are individual participants in each of these three groups. Okay, so the ability to behave in structure sensitive ways is clearly educational dependent, education dependent. Um, and um, a similar argument occurs for understanding geometric concepts. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but the basic point is that it's only people who are in, uh, who are in mathematics degree programs who actually are capable of reasoning mathematically. Okay, so wait, wait, maybe there's a genetic basis for being a mathematical reasoner. I don't think so. Of course, that's arguable. This data doesn't show that. The authors who sort of um, made these kinds of points argued that this was a matter of acquiring a special kind of cognitive ability to think in abstract terms and uh, reason deductively. Um, so that's the argument that we don't build this stuff in, we learn it through experience with um, systems that exhibit these characteristics, but maybe it's a special kind of experience too, because everybody speaks the language, but only the graduate students uh, think abstractly um, about things uh, in, in these categorical and structure sense of ways. Okay, so interim summer, summary number two, um, Maybe it's true that to be really powerful thinkers, we need to be able to think this way, but it doesn't mean that that's built in. It could be that we achieve our power as uh, mathematicians and computer scientists um, by virtue of being inculcated in a system of thought that structures our thinking in ways that allow us to do that. Okay, so my time is virtually up. So I'm just going to um, uh, try to conclude quickly um, and talk about what will it take to build machines that are truly intelligent, that have this kind of ability. And I'm gonna note that to answer this, we need to decide what we think it means to be truly intelligent. 
Uh, and um, I have found myself motivated uh, by these two quotes from two people who I think are amazingly intelligent exam examples of amazing uh, in intellectual power. Uh, Jean Poincaré um, said, it is by logic that we prove, but by intuition that we discover. And Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And what I see these things as picking up on is the idea that, um, you know, what somehow we've done is we've harnessed these intuitive aspects of our abilities that um, are reflected in our ability to use multiple constraints in perception and language understanding and um, are, are rooted in the, in the biological foundations of our intelligence to give us those intuitions and then culture and uh, developed uh, conventions of thought and reasoning um, and programming languages and computers and all of these various tools then allow us to um, engage in these logic-like practices that extend these powers and allow us to uh, do the amazing things that we've been able to do uh, with human intelligence. So what we want to do is build machines that can exploit intuition and acquire systematic cognitive abilities. And I do have some more thoughts on that, but I'd rather take your questions um, and maybe uh, in response to one or two of the questions, I would uh, share uh, one or two of my further thoughts. Thanks. Thank you again, Jay. This was an incredibly interesting uh, talk. Um, so first, uh, I want to see if anyone here has questions uh, or, or otherwise, I, I have a few. Um, people can raise their hands or they can just speak up. I do have a question. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about like the the discipline aspect, discipline is an academic discipline of the um, Hill House Bird experiment. Like were the undergraduates separated by discipline at all? Um, no, it, 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 it um, you know, I think somebody should get a grant and uh, study this further. <laughs> I think maybe I'd even write a grant proposal myself to do more of this, this kind of thing. Um, uh, sometimes, but then I get too busy and then I forget about it and so it doesn't happen, but, but it really needs much more thought. I, I think uh, much more um, exploration. And uh, so that's a great question. Do you have any like intuition about whether being in a technical discipline or being in graduate school is the thing that set the grad student group apart? Yeah, I, I, I believe that um, engagement in disciplined mathematical thought um, and success at that um, is um, an important relevant predictor uh, here. And, and um, our Sudoku study provided some evidence of that because um, there, there were two sort of things. The, the small subgroup out of like hundreds of people that we screened who actually had master's or PhD degrees, all were solvers. Um, but among those who didn't have those level of degrees, um, what seemed to predict whether they were solvers or not was whether they had, whether they said that they had taken a algebra and a geometry class in high school. Now, it, that was a little surprising to us because I think everybody has to take at least algebra, right? Um, uh, but uh, so, so why it is that they said they didn't or some of them said they didn't and that was a predictor of whether they succeeded or not. It may, may just be they're signaling, oh, I'm not a math person, you know? Uh, and, and so again, you know, there are issues about individual differences. Like, is there some sort of G-like factor that, you know, allows us to be systematic thinkers and that's why people go into those majors and many people are gonna keep arguing that. And of course there has to be some 
individual variability that influences these things, but I also think that experience uh, and uh, in immersion in engaging in sort of structured reasoning tasks, like, you know, doing your homework in math class <laughs> uh, is uh, gonna be important in uh, acquiring these abilities. But that's what I think about it. Well, thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. And, and thank you, Jay. In fact, that makes me, when I was hearing you say that, I, I was thinking that it sort of had analogies to AI in that you can think of uh, the ability of a fine-tuned model to perform a particular task um, is, is better than, say, a more generalized model. And so I, I would think that in a, in a human context, uh, people who have, say, more, maybe more general or maybe more practical education uh, would not be as, as well-tuned to a particular specialized task as those who've taken, um, uh, done education or, or part of their job reflects uh, 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 sort of important parts of that task. If you're, if you're good at, st or if you, if you do work related to math or related to uh, sort of abstract understanding, that might make you better at Sudoku than just being generally well at, at a lot of different things. Yeah, that I, I agree um, to a large extent with what you've said. Mm -hmm. um, I would add um, a comment though, which is that um, there is a sense in which um, the, uh, I believe this, uh, I don't, uh, maybe it's gonna take a long time to sort this out, but I, I really think that there is a certain sort of practice with engaging in the process of coming up with a relevant abstraction and articulating it that um, produces a skill that can be applied in a more general way than um, what we usually uh, see in our neural networks that are trained in a limited domain and then we ask them to generalize because they acquired it in this other more literal uh, gradual learning kind of way. And so that's, you know, by virtue of acquiring the ability to think in logical ways like think counterfactually and various things like that, in abstract contexts, as opposed to in familiar ones where you've already thought about it before, you, you actually acquire an ability that will then generalize whenever such a skill is useful. Uh, and it's, a, it's an abstract ability that makes us different kinds of intelligences so that we can apply these tools more readily when we're we come to a completely new domain, um, because the tools themselves are so abstract that they have that capability. So I I, I feel like this is a little bit of hand waving right now, but that's kind of the idea that I have. So I agree with you fundamentally, but this this abstract ability is something that might be able to supervene across disciplines once you get the ability to like do this abstraction as such. And, and just uh, those words all need to be refined, but that's it, it, the uh, intuition. That's a really good point. It reminds me, we had a talk a few uh, months ago uh, by someone in the Simon Foundation mm -hmm. who was able to create a, a neural network that could um, work well in solving, I think it was like middle schooler and high schooler standardized tests from New York, uh, New York City. Um, and he was saying that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of abstract understanding of a problem and then there's a concrete understanding of a problem. And the concrete was what, for example, IBM's Watson is very good at. When, when you're doing Jeopardy, you just want to spit out stuff that you've seen before. While for these particular uh, tests, uh, the abstraction, understanding sort of what is it that the question is saying rather than just spitting out facts that you knew before, make the network, make the problem both harder 
and, and something that this particular network is able to solve. So uh, uh, to his eyes, uh, sort of the better way of, of understanding sort of many general problems can in some ways be helped by sort of a neural network having some abstract understanding. And maybe that there's something similar uh, with what we're seeing here. I'm not sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And we're not sure. So that means we've got a great question for the next 10 years of research to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I know it's noon, so we might need a, a stop, but is there any single uh, question people might have? Um, all right, with that, I think uh, it was a great talk, Jay, and uh, I think we can stop the recording, Alma, to uh, talk and... Uh,